Hey friends, how's everyone doing today? Hope you're all having an amazing and super, super productive day so far. Tammy M coming to you from TammyMCoaching.com. And what I wanna to talk to you about today is the roles that we play in dysfunctional families. The roles that we play in dysfunctional families. If we haven't met before, I'll take a quick moment to properly introduce myself. Like I said, my name is Tammy M. I am an empowerment coach for women. I help women break free from painful relationship patterns so they can experience the love that they deserve. And today's topic, I think, is a pretty big one. A pretty big one. You know, they say 85 to 95% of us here on planet Earth grew up in some level of dysfunction in our family right like there's obviously varying degrees it, these are not black or white issues but 85 to 95 percent of us here on planet earth did not receive the proper good enough parenting the proper love and care and nurturing and support and guidance that we needed growing up to become healthy high functional uh, high functioning adults that's a pretty high percentage. Now, obviously, again, there's varying degrees, right? Many of us have been on the receiving end of, you know, different kinds of abuse throughout our lives as a result of growing up in family dysfunction. Often those of us that were abused were abused by people who themselves had been abused, hurt people, hurt people, you know? So it's these vicious family cycles that we're looking to break right by stepping into our own power doing our own healing work and that starts with understanding that starts with gathering the information but we don't heal with the information that's just how we start to wake up and then hopefully if you're blessed enough you muster up the courage and the strength to get into the healing work. And that's what I'm really all about. So before I dive into today's material, I'm gonna say hi to some friends I see hopping on. Elizabeth, thanks for joining, nice to see you. Colleen, thank you for joining. Sean, how are you? Nice to see you, girl, thanks for hopping on. And uh, Natalie, nice to see you, thanks for hopping on. I've got some newcomers here today, so welcome, welcome. If we haven't um, done this before, if you haven't been on one of my live broadcasts before, what I'm gonna ask you to do is if you're catching the broadcast live, drop me a one in the comments. If you happen to be catching the replay, drop a two in the comments. And if you're new to my live broadcast, let me know you're new, let me know where you're coming in from so I can reach out and say hello. Would love to make contact. So. The roles that we play in dysfunctional families. Now, I first learned about these roles in uh, my codependency recovery years and years ago when I when I got on the road to, you know, healing and recovery from codependency and narcissistic abuse and, you know, all of that stuff. Basically, you know, like the family of origin stuff that so many of us grow up with and then we wonder why we're so freaking crippled in our adult lives, right? So this is when this, was, this information was first introduced to me and it was through Adult Child of Alcoholism, ACOA, that movement. If you're an adult child of an alcoholic family, that is a really, really powerful movement to get involved in and to go seek some help and some guidance. Their literature is amazing, very, very powerful. It's, in my opinion, not the only thing that we need to do, but it's certainly a really good first step. So that's where I was first introduced to this information. And I got to tell you, when I look at this, and it's been, you know, I'm 13 years into my recovery journey now, I can tell you that it just like, the, it's like the bright lights get brighter and brighter in terms of awareness and understanding. Like I look at this and I know exactly who in my family of origin, including in my extended family of origin, falls into what category? Who falls into what category? So these are the roles that we tend to play in dysfunctional families, whether those are alcoholic families or not. I'll just say quickly before I start with, you know, the information on the specific roles, you know, um, in my humble opinion, based on my experience personally, my entire life, professionally as well, alcoholic families tend to be very narcissistic. Alcoholic families tend to be very narcissistic, but 
whether there was alcohol or not, or whether there was drug abuse or not, or whether there was physical violence or not, whether you grew up with money or without or somewhere in between is not the determining factor. So it's not because you grew up in a house where there was not active alcoholism that you were not narcissistically abused. It's not because you grew up in a house where there was no physical violence that you were not subject to abuse on some level, right? So again, these are not black or white issues. So just something to bear in mind. And guys, as always, if anything I say leaves you with any questions, drop me a comment or send me a private message and let me know so I can further clarify. I would love to connect with you. So let's get going. The roles of dysfunctional family. First and foremost, top of the list, the chief enabler. The chief enabler. So you know, this assumes that we've got either an active alcoholic or an addict or a full-blown destructive narcissist, malignant narcissist, pathological narcissist, maybe even sociopath, right? We've got a destructive person at the heart of all of this and the roles are the roles that the family around the destructive person take on, okay? So first and foremost, the chief enabler. So this person is usually a spouse or significant other. Generally speaking, enablers will do everything possible to make the destructive and or addictive behavior stop accept what works, accept what works. Like how freaking true is that? Again, I don't want to, I don't want this to turn into an hour long um, live broadcast. I want to try and keep it very succinct for you to give you as much value as possible. But when I think about my family of origin, like, oh my God, everything except what works. And these are not necessarily stupid people. These are not stupid people, but they will do everything. They will try everything except what works. Confronting the destructive person or leaving the relationship is not what's done. That's not what's done. You know, the things that would actually work, like confronting or saying, I'm out until you step up, you know, and getting the hell out of the way, stopping, you know, get out of God's way, step aside so they can actually hit the floor and feel the consequences of their appalling behavior. Try that and see what happens. So many people who stay engaged in dysfunctional family dynamics, I don't know, do you have any examples of this in your family? You know, and, and, and this will go on for decades and decades and decades. Meanwhile, generation after generation of children are being effective, uh, affected it's really really sad really really heartbreaking enabling behavior is habitual it will often continue for many years until something catastrophic happens until something catastrophic happens and the sad thing is sometimes that's death or worse sometimes that's death or worse because sometimes the easy way out is death you know, there are worse things than dying. There are worse things than dying. And often this kind of really sick and insane enabling behavior will go on until something catastrophic happens. And that can be decades. That can be decades, right? Really, 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 really sad. Um, but, you know, people do what they do. People do what they do. Next on the list of dysfunctional uh, roles that we play, because they're dysfunctional roles, obviously, uh, in the dysfunctional family, which maintain the dys dysfunctional dynamics, right? So next is the hero. Anyone recognize the hero? Maybe you've been the hero, the overachiever, right? The one that really steps up and helps make it all look real good on the outside. Meanwhile, on the inside, it's a freaking train wreck. This is the person in the family who sees and hears what is happening and takes responsibility for the family pain by becoming successful or popular, or both. The hero is often the oldest child in the family, burdened with an over sense of responsibility, right? Far too young. So the hero is often the oldest child in the family unit and often forms an alliance with sober members. And sober isn't just about alcohol or drug addiction. Sober is about mental health and wellness, right? Varying degrees. But the hero is often the oldest child in the family unit and often forms an alliance with sober family members of the family. This person is sometimes thought of as the good child or the angel or the golden child, right? And is a source of stability and dependability. 
it's a source of they become a source of stability relatively speaking and dependability heroes may overcompensate for a dependent person's behaviors or a destructive person's behaviors through over -achieve achievement and my friends the heroes that I have observed in my lifetime personally and professionally and in my on my own recovery journey those that I have known pay a very 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 high price for taking on that role a very high price for taking on that role next the lost child the lost child this one breaks my heart this is the family member who quietly and unobtrusively withdraws from the family system this is often the third child in birth order not always but often who like the middle child right who is quickly overwhelmed by the environment by the dysfunction by the chaos by the drama by the pain by all of it as well as older siblings this person often gives up and tends to be isolated physically emotionally and psychologically heartbreaking next we have the mascot or the joker the mascot or the joker in many cases this is the youngest child within the family unit this person likes to play the class clown and jokes around a lot to relieve family tension conversations with mascots often are superficial because deep meaningful dialogue can trigger deep pain and shame so they just don't go there like know anyone in your life like that that's always performing that's always trying to lighten the mood that's you know and and often like uh, inappropriately so right doesn't have an appropriate sense of behavior uh, sense of humor um, you know they often try to be funny or make light of a given situation in order to relieve the family tension or to gain parental attention or to gain any attention maladaptive ways of relating to ourselves and to others we learn them in childhood and we carry them into our into our adult lives and we wonder why we struggle and we wonder why we struggle last but not least we have the scapegoat we have the scapegoat now this one is is close to my heart because I got to be the family scapegoat in my family and I chuckle not because it's funny um, but you know a lot of the clients that I work with oddly enough have been the family scapegoat as well and it's really really painful to grow up as the family scapegoat but if this one resonates with you I want you to understand from my perspective and understanding from a spiritual perspective and understanding we are warriors we really are warriors whether our family of origin can recognize our worth whether our family of origin sees us for who we are or not usually they don't they can't through the lens of their own distorted perception of reality we really are those of us who hit the planet and came into dysfunctional family dynamics and grew up being the family scapegoat there is a larger purpose in all of this I truly believe that so this is the family member who commonly rejects the family system one way or another one way or another commonly rejects the family system I remember being really young and looking around going like this is nuts and I grew up with my grandmother but like just in terms of like what was going on in the other households in my immediate family of origin like I was really young I knew what an alcoholic was when I was five for crying out loud full 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 on full tilt knew exactly what that was and what that was all about by the time I was five maybe some of you can relate to that you know um, really really young when we're looking around going like what the hell right the one who usually who actually has the courage to stand up and to the best of their ability say something about what's really going on at a certain point you know maybe not when we're still tiny and vulnerable or maybe you know but one way or another I know by the time I was you know rebelling as a young teenager I had some things to say about some things and some people and you know some things that had gone on did I have the courage to say it all did I have the language to say it all did I have the wherewithal to say it all no some of those things I didn't have the courage or the wherewithal to say to speak the truth until I was 40 but it started when I was real young it started when I was real young those of us who grew up in these kind of family dynamics I mean we've had 
mountains of stuff heaped on us, mountains of stuff heaped on us, right? So because they refuse to go along to get along, that was definitely me, and have a tendency to speak the truth as they see it or feel it, again, to the best of their ability, this sets them up to be a target. This sets them up to be a target, especially if you grew up in a narcissistic family, especially. You know, when, when a narcissist anywhere high on the spectrum, when a destructive narcissist senses, because they're hyper vigilant, hyper, you know, aware in some ways, very cagey, right? When they sense that you're onto them, whether you say anything or not, they feel that you are onto them, you are immediately a target. Really important to recognize that. When we were kids, there wasn't much we could do about that. But as an adult, there's a lot we can do about that. Like get the hell away from them. Like get the hell away from them. It's no fun being a target. It's no fun being a target. The scapegoat is often, but not always, the second oldest child in the family and gets the family's attention by developing angry and defiant behaviors. Scapegoats are usually blamed for all the wrongs happening in the family, even at a very young age. At five years old, I was the one carted off to a therapist because I was acting out. And as an adult, looking back on that situation and what was actually going on, holy cow, holy cow. So for me, being blamed for what was going on within the family dynamic started at five. Can any of you relate to that? It can often start really young where it makes no sense at all. Like, does nobody have enough common sense to go, well, you know, not what's wrong with her or what's wrong with him, but what the hell happened to him? or her because this is really not normal behavior, right? I remember at 14, and I share these personal experiences with you, not, you know, more, more than anything because I want to hopefully inspire you, help you realize that you're not alone. You're not alone. These things, these awful experiences have happened to many of us. So uh, I remember being 14 and being accused by who I now understand today was a very sick uncle, like a very sick uncle. High on the end of narcissism, high on the uh, spectrum of destructive narcissism. But being accused at the age of 14, I was 13, just turned 14, of trying to break up the marriage of another aunt and uncle, who I don't believe I, we even lived in the same city. But I, that's what was being projected onto me. And I remember at that age, like just being like frozen, shocked, like I, I, I had no resources or ability or tools to defend myself couldn't even understand where that was coming from it was so insane and nonsensical at the age of 14 as if I would have the you know the conscious wherewithal to even like who comes up with this shit who sick destructive narcissistic people come up with this shit right but I just remember being like my brain was fried today knowing what I know and looking back on that situation I have to ask myself whose marriage he was trying to break up because that's the only logical explanation they project onto us what they refuse to own acknowledge accept or see within themselves it was a total brain fry for me at the time and hurt hurt like hell I had no idea what to do with this that was you know being puked all over me I know where it was coming from this my friends is what it's like to grow up as the family scapegoat this kind of shit coming at you all the time from you know the people who are meant to be loving loving you nurturing you guiding you keeping you safe right it's crazy 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 okay so where were we Scapegoats are, are usually blamed for all the wrongs happening in the family, even at a very young age. Many times these in, individuals are referred to as the black sheep. Even in a family filled with black sheep, I come from a family full of black sheep and I'm the black sheep in a family filled with black sheep. Like it's fascinating, it's fascinating. They get to be the dumping ground and garbage bin for the rest of the family's projected pain, unresolved trauma, and unconscious shadow patterns of behavior, in my humble opinion. Based on my experience, a lifetime of it, as well as the work that I do with clients. 
that's pretty much what it's about, which is why I started this one off by saying, if this one resonates with you, because it does for a lot of the people that I work with, you must understand that there is a flip side to this coin and you, my friend, are a spiritual warrior. To be in the midst of a highly toxic, dysfunctional, abusive family and to be the one who is the target, the garbage bin for everyone else's unresolved issues and projected pain and all of that stuff and you're still intact today, you're a freaking warrior. You're a freaking warrior. They are used within the family to deflect the attention away from what is really going on. And the burden of responsibility for the family's problems are heaped onto their shoulders. Never mind that we have an active lunatic, highly narcissistic alcoholic and a raging, insane, completely obsessed, love addicted codependent and all of that going on over our five year old head. Never mind that, we're the problem. Insane. It's insane. And it's really, really important that if we grew up in these dynamics that we start to connect these dots so that we can heal and we're not attracting more of this nonsense into our adult lives because this is what we were programmed with before we had a choice. Really, really important. So where was I? Almost done. Getting to the bottom here. As long as we focus on what's wrong with him or her, the child, the scapegoat, we don't have to look at ourselves is the mantra. That's really what it boils down to. Guys, that's a, you know, a pretty good overview. There's there's a, you know, more breakdown in terms of, you know, the roles that can be played like these are the umbrellas and then you can break them down even more. So if that's interesting to you, you can do your own research. There's lots of really good information on the internet or if you have any questions, you can reach out to me. But that's pretty much how the family system works. And like I said, those roles all revolve around the one central, usually the one central active alcoholic, active addict, and or highly destructive narcissist, whether that's a pathological narcissist, uh, you know, a malignant narcissist, uh, you know, all, all the ways that that breaks down, right? Right, all the way over to sociopathy. These roles evolve, re revolve around that individual, that, and, and by virtue of playing those roles, keep that individual propped up and keep all of the uh, family dysfunction going on for years and years and years, and decades and decades and decades, generation after generation. Scary, scary. Like, is it not time to start breaking these cycles? I think so. Guys, like, I hope you got some value out of this. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to like, comment, and or share. Once again, my name is Tammy M. I am an empowerment coach for women. I help women break free from painful relationship patterns so they can experience the love that they deserve. And if you are looking to add something really powerful to your recovery journey, if you are looking to step onto the path of recovery and and begin to do some of your own work in terms of healing yourself so that you can recover from narcissistic abuse and stop attracting it into your life and you can recover from adult child issues and stop you know, relating in these maladaptive ways and really fully step into your full power, your empowerment, the woman that you came to this planet to be. I have an eight week intensive program called the Freedom Class. It rocks. It absolutely rocks. And if that resonates with you and piques your curiosity, drop me a comment, send me a private message, and I'll send you the information on that. It's eight weeks designed to get you from where you are to where you want to be, well on your way. Quantum leaps forward inside of this eight week program, The Freedom Class. So again, if you want some information on that, let me know. I'll send you the details. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you friends for hopping on. I appreciate all of you. If I missed anyone, my apologies. But uh, go enjoy the rest of your day and I will look forward to catching up with you real soon. Mwah! Much love. Oh, as always, know your value. Know your value and unlock your freedom. Bye for now.